Hello everyone. I am not sure if anyone's watching, which is okay. Um, this will be recorded afterwards um, so that anyone who wants to watch the recording should do it. This is my first time going live on Facebook, so I am a little bit nervous. Um, but I shared a bunch of these things with the ladies at our church a week ago. And I feel like God um, put it on my heart to share it again this way for people who weren't able to come because they were sick or um, for other people on Facebook or out there who he wanted to lead to what I'm going to share today. Um, <clears throat> So without further ado, um, let me pull up my notes here and I'll dive in. I should have had them pulled up already, but all the technical stuff of figuring out how to do this took longer than I expected and didn't get that far. <laughs> Okay, so this is going to be a series of short stories and the lessons that I learned from them in the last two years. Um, everybody knows the last two years have been quite different than what most of us have experienced prior to 2022. Um, for me, they've been the most amazing years of my life. Um, not that there hasn't been challenges and so forth, but because of the things that God has done in in me, uh, things that I have prayed for for decades and wanted very much. Um, and I feel like there's no no going back, no no looking back. I don't want to go back. <laughs> um, so these stories are by no means everything that he's done in me in the last two years. They're just the highlights and a few specific things that he put on my heart to share publicly um, after after a while. They were private for a while, but I, I think he wants me to share them now. So these last two years, as many have um constantly said have been unprecedented um, and at least for me I have heard that phrase so many times over the last two years that I started to get really tired of it especially since pandemics aren't unprecedented it doesn't take more than a couple minute glance through history to see that this per pandemic has actually been pretty mild compared to some that the earth has seen over the centuries. Even over the last 200 years, this one's been mild considering the percentage of people who have died. And I'm not trying to minimize those who have died and who have lost people at all. Um, I'm just talking about how that word unprecedented started grating on my nerves. But eventually I began seeing that God was doing unprecedented things in his people at the same time. And so now I like the word because the things that I see that God is doing are actually truly unprecedented because his plan through time always moves forward. It never goes back to things that had been. He's always doing something new. That's one of my favorite verses in Isaiah. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Won't you be aware of it? Look. He's always doing new things. And therefore, what he is doing is truly unprecedented and very exciting. At least to me. <laughs> you know, there have been many revivals over the last number of centuries that Christian historians like to look at and talk about, and many Christians have been praying for revival again for a long time. But I have personally felt for quite a few years now 
that the next great move of God, as we like to call it, was going to be, um, <clears throat> it was going to be different than previous moves. It wasn't going to be in a particular location. It wasn't going to be centered around one or several specific evangelists. It was going to be grassroots. It was going to be something that happened in thousands and tens of thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of individual people, normal people like me who who don't have much of a platform, just, you know, whatever my friends and family and maybe my church, um, but tons of people like me who don't have big platforms, um, that he is going to work and transform our lives closer and closer to what he wants them to be and that his next great move was going to be using all of those people in a concerted, combined, unified move of him that was orchestrated entirely by him and not by charismatic leaders or evangelists or that wasn't centered around a particular place. And I have felt this for, for many years. And I hoped and prayed that I would see it in my lifetime. And what I see is that in 2020, God, who works all things to the good of those whom he calls, um, began using the pandemic to do this, to start this. And the wave is starting and the wave is rising. And I say this because the things that he's doing in me, I see mirrored in other people that I talk to, that I read their comments, that I read blog posts or Facebook pay posts around the world. There's a lot of people who are lost and struggling and hurting, but there's also quite a few people who have been seeking God for years and who are experiencing, like me, breakthroughs and shifts and changes in their walk with God that are unique to them but similar to mine in that God is is pulling so many of us closer to him and doing amazing things. So for me 2020 started out really rough. <laughs> um, not because anything rough happened at the beginning of 2020 in January but because of where I was at the beginning of 2020. Um, I have walked with God essentially my whole life um, and I can look back in my uh, middle school years in my teenage years in my 20s and there were many pivotal moments when God did powerful things in my life and um, I've shared a lot of those stories on my website um, there's a lot that hasn't gone on there, but I've walked with God quite a bit. He's shown me a lot. I've grown a lot over the years, and many of those lessons and things that he was working on were were learning to trust him. Um, and I'm probably a pretty stubborn person, I'm thinking, because some of those lessons, it took him years <laughs> for me <laughs> to learn how to trust him more. Um, I must not be a very fast learner in that regard. But so at the beginning of 2020, I was in a place, however, where despite all those years of following God and walking with God, I felt burned out and overwhelmed by everything in my life, just about. Um, my job I'd had for 10 years and I loved the people there, but it was a job that had become something that pretty much never stopped. I was on call 24 seven. And after a lot of years, that was just exhausting. Um, and I felt like that was taking so much time from my husband and my family that I wasn't giving them the time that I should be giving them. Um, 
I spent time with God here and there and sometimes focused for a long time and sometimes haphazard hi God here and there throughout the day. It was kind of all over the place and I felt that I needed to give God more of my focused attention. I had been slowly gaining weight for a couple of years and um, health, health problems. I, I wasn't having severe health problems. God had had set me free from a lot of those six or seven years ago, but I still knew that um, I needed for, to take better care of myself for my health as well. Um, so I felt all of these things, I had desires inside of me, things that I wanted to do ministry wise to reach out to people. And I felt like all of them were suffering. And if I tried to give any of them the attention that they needed, then all the others were going to fall flat and collapse. And that's how I felt at the beginning of 2022. I had been searching for a new job for almost two years at that point. Um, not like crazy searching, but just here and there praying, God, where should I apply? What should I look? When's the time going to come? And nothing was happening. I had received by that time dozens of rejection letters, <laughs> um, which could be a little demoralizing, but I kept reminding myself I don't want the job that's separate from what God has for me. So if these doors closed, then that wasn't for God. And despite how frustrating this is, and I'm still going to continue trusting him. <sighs> that's kind of how I was handling it. Um, so that's how I started out 2022. And just praying that God would do something. And another big thing that I had been praying and asking God for for many years for 19 years at that point to be precise is that he would teach me to hear him speak to me teach me to hear and recognize his voice um more clearly by that time um growing up i didn't know that god wants to speak to all of his children all all, all christians and sometimes he speaks even to non-christians but i didn't know that somehow i'm not sure why i didn't know that um i just assumed that when people said God talked to them, that they were either you know, like super spiritual or pastors or people who were, you know, high up or whatever, or I figured they were lying to manipulate people. And some of them certainly were leaders in the church. Um, and I also think some certainly were lying to manipulate people, <laughs> but it never occurred to me that God actually wanted to speak to me until I believe it was uh, 2001 or somewhere in that, in that area, that point of my life. Um, you can read a little bit of that story on my website. If you follow the, um, ultimate makeover testimony story that I have there on hope is calling.com. Anyway. Um, so at that point I started asking God, wow, Lord, if, your spirit lives in me like the Bible says, then you're speaking to me and I haven't been recognizing it. Teach me to recognize it. And so by by the beginning of 2020, um, I had learned to hear God through the Bible as I journaled. So I um, would take out a journal, I would read my Bible and I would write in my in my journal the questions that I had and the things that I was thinking about the scriptures and over time I learned that God showed me his word that way he he opened my mind to understand things that I hadn't understood 20 minutes before when I started writing um, and I treasured and valued that um, I had also learned that God spoke to me through um, a song in the morning and frequently when I wake up in the morning I would hear a song inside my head and I learned to listen and ask God if he was trying to tell me something through that song um, I listen predominantly to Christian worship music just because that's what I love that's part of my life <laughs> a lot of my life is, is involved in worship music um, but it wasn't always a worship song that I would wake up with in the morning. Sometimes it would be a secular song, but God can speak to us through anything. And, um, you know, this might make you laugh, but it's, 
kind of like the God would use songs kind of the way that the movie makers did for the Bumblebee character on the Transformers movie. <laughs> um, I'm not a big movie watcher at all, but that is a movie that I saw, and he couldn't actually talk in that movie. He had a radio, so he would spin the radio to different channels and different songs to use phrases out of songs to communicate with people in that movie. And, you know, that's kind of similar of how I learned that God would use songs in the morning. The first thing in the morning before my mind could take over and start uh, thinking about the day and the, the worries of life or the to-do list that I had or whatever. Um, that song I would listen and I learned over time that he would frequently speak to me that way. Um, sometimes the song would direct me to a scripture in the Bible that would just come alive to me when I'd read it. Other times the song would lead me to, to something else throughout the day that he, that meant something to me that, that ministered to me in a way that I needed that particular day. Um, I remember one time it was a song that I heard and I went to find the song on YouTube and I listened to the whole song and I'm like, God, I know this is a song I woke up with, but I'm not really feeling like, you know, you're pointing anything out to me. And I got distracted and YouTube advanced to the next song, which was a completely different worship music group that I'd never heard of, didn't know of. And that video is the one that ministered to me for days afterwards, that worship video. So God had used the song to lead me to YouTube so that you, because he knew YouTube would advance to the one that he actually was ministering to me through. So it's a, a huge range. You know, sometimes it's just one word or phrase out of a song. Sometimes it's the whole song that just fills my spirit and encourages me throughout the day. So those are the two main words, ways that I had learned at that point to receive directly from God, to hear God talking to me. But I used to really worry that, you know, God, what if I'm in a grocery store and there's somebody who is suicidal and they need somebody to reach out to them and tell them that you love them and I'm there and I don't hear and recognize you say, go tell them I love them. And, you know, what, what happens if I can't hear you? I need to be able to hear you. And I've been praying that, so by, by 2020, I've been praying that for many years. And I felt like I hadn't gotten anywhere. And I, I was really frustrated about it. The frustration had just been growing for a long time. Um, <clears throat> so that's how I started out 2020. Um, just making it, I felt like barely making it through my days with God's help, barely making it through my days through January, February. Um, and then came March 13th. <laughs> now I have it written down in my journal because it was a pivotal day for me. It, it became uh, the moment that these stories started, even though I didn't know it at the time. But, um, I woke up that morning and the song in my mind was, the song that was running through me was the song from Frozen, the Disney cartoon. <laughs> Um, my daughter loves Disney movies, even though she's in her twenties, <laughs> she wasn't married yet at the time. So she was home and I wasn't sure. I was like, was she listening to it yesterday? Is that why I'm hearing it? No, Lord, I trust that you put the songs in my mind in the morning. You could put any song in there. What's the message? And the line that I heard was the one where she sings, this is my rite of passage, my turn to be brave. And, um, so I heard mostly that line, but I went and I pulled up the whole song. I pulled up all the lyrics. I was like, God, what, what are you saying to me through this? And the rest of the lyrics just kind of faded away, but I felt like God's finger was pointing to that line that I had woken up with. This is my rite of passage, my turn to be brave. So I was like, okay, Lord, what are you saying? I didn't hear anything, <clears throat> didn't sense anything, I didn't feel anything. So eventually I went about my day, I went, I went to work, which I worked from home, so going to work meant booting up my computer and going over to my desk and 
um, getting to work with email and chat and everything else. And every so often, I'd still hear that line echo through my mind. And again, I'd say, Lord, why that line? And um, at one point, partway through the day, when I prayed that, I felt like he whispered, it's for you to hold on to through what's coming. And I was like, Lord, was that you? But I felt a peace about it, that what I had heard was God, even though it wasn't like an audible voice or anything. It was just kind of a whispered thought that went really gently through my mind. Um, but the peace that came with it, the fact that I felt like my Lord, what does this mean question was answered is why I was like, okay, Lord, I think that was you talking to me. And so I started thinking about what that meant, what a rite of passage means. And it means that you're going to go through something difficult, but it's not just something difficult for the sake of being difficult. It's something difficult, but on the other side is a new level, a new um, achievement, a new, I don't know what word to use other than a new level. That's what a rite of passage means in you know any culture that has them. It's something that when you get through it on the other side, you're not the same person that you were in the beginning. You're not, you're at a new level of promotion or, or whatever it happens to be. So I started to get excited. Um, I was like a little bit, I felt a little bit of trepidation as to what this thing was I was gonna go through. But at the same time, if it meant a new level, I was like, okay, maybe this means the new job finally. I, I wanna get, I feel stuck where I'm at anyway, so okay, bring it on is kind of how I felt. Um, and that was May 3rd, uh, I'm sorry, March 13th was a Friday. So, you know, I was thinking about this over the weekend and that was the weekend that we started hearing, at least that I started hearing um, news about this virus over in China. And I didn't think too much of it at first. I don't think most of us did. We'd heard other rumors of viruses in Africa and other parts of the world. And usually it was just a news item for a couple days or a couple weeks and it kind of faded on and life continued. Um, so I didn't think much of it at first, but by Monday, that's when people started talking about shutdowns. And for me at work, um, my company lost about 95% of our work that day, that Monday. And that was very difficult for me. I was the senior manager. I had over a hundred people relying on my management to keep their work. And so it fell to me to tell them, I'm sorry, your work is suddenly gone. For a couple of them, they had a couple weeks work left or a couple days work left. But for a lot of them, it was done in less than 24 hours. And, um, the people, you know, that company, they were independent contractors, so there was no insurance, there was no hourly stuff, there was no PPP, there was no anything. It was just suddenly their work was gone, and I cried so much that day having to tell all those people that it was one of the most difficult days of my life to have to say that. All, all these people that I'd worked for... 10 years to build up those projects and programs and I'd hired and trained almost all of them and suddenly I had to tell them I'm sorry your work's gone and and your income's gone and there's nothing I can do and I was like god this this rite of passage was supposed to be difficult for me not for not for them that's this isn't fair <laughs> Um, so it was really difficult. Um, and the next two months continued to be difficult in different ways. Um, I was busy for a couple days closing stuff down with the shutdowns. Um, and at the same time I was thinking maybe this is what's going to lead to my next job. So I wasn't too worried about it. Um, and all of a sudden I went to having almost nothing to do. But it didn't suddenly make life better for, for me and how I had felt overwhelmed by everything right after that. 
I was still so burnt out that um, I still I kind of I don't I don't know if it was depression or what but I followed the news like a lot of us did crazy in those days um, I was on social media a lot I started getting angry all the time at opinions that I saw that I didn't agree with or that didn't make any sense to me um, I slept a lot I cried a lot <laughs> Um, about the only thing I started doing was going for a walk, um, every day. I knew I needed the exercise, but the reality was that I was going for the walk as almost to run away, to get away from what was left. Um, I didn't want to do any of the things I knew I should be doing. Um, I just would go for a walk to get out of the house, to get away from everything. And these my walks we have a dead end road right near my house and that's where I'd go and I would just cry out to God God what is going on I feel you know I pour out my heart to him how frustrated I felt and I cry I raise my hands to the sky I'd yell sometimes <laughs> and since it was a dead end road there was hard nobody to hear me and if anyone did see what the crazy woman walking along the road railing at the sky was <laughs> Oh well, <laughs> that's what I was doing. Um, and over the course of those those two months in the rest of March and April, um, I it was it was just difficult. But looking back, it was what God was doing was letting things come up that I had buried. Um, for a little while sometimes I wondered if it was a spiritual attack but looking back it's quite clear to me it was no spiritual attack not really I mean sure the devil was attacking me here and there or whatever it was me my flesh it was stuff that I had buried that was coming up that I needed to deal with that I needed to stop ignoring that I needed to stop shoving down um, Eventually, I came to a day out there where I was walking where I felt like I was face to face with a question that God was asking me. And again, I didn't hear any specific words. I just felt like I was face to face with the choice. Would I continue to love God, serve God, worship him if nothing ever changed in my life? If I continued to feel overwhelmed, if he never gave me a new job, if he never resolved the issues that I had with with certain people in my life if if I never um, found a way to exercise and eat healthier and enjoy it <laughs> um, if I never got was able to hear his voice the way I wanted to the way certain other people that I respected it seemed that they could if if he never changed anything was I still willing to serve him and I kind of felt like I was smack up face to face with that question and I had to answer it and in answering it I had to repent of I had to forgive people that I've been holding things against them and I had to repent because I had been holding things against God because he hadn't brought me a new job yet because even though I'd been asking for 19 years for him to teach me how to hear my voice, I felt like he hadn't and wasn't, and and he wasn't doing things like I thought he should. And um, I had to repent of that. And on that particular walk, it's, it's a walk in a day that I remember very clearly. I sobbed my heart out to God. I repented. I said, okay, God, whatever you want, whatever you want, I'm willing, because I know that my answer is in you. And when I walked back to the house at the end of those, I think it was probably two or three hours I was out there. Um, and I think this was in towards the end of April. When I walked back to the house within an hour or so, I started noticing how different I felt. I didn't, I just felt uplifted. I felt, um, I don't know how to describe it, just the, the weight and the trouble that I had been, felt like I'd been carrying 
for a long time and that had become uh, magnified over the last couple weeks, that weight was gone. And by the end of the day, I recognized that I had been completely healed of a bunch of emotional baggage that I'd been carrying for a long time. I could, by the next day, I could not believe the difference. I felt like a completely new person. And I realized and I learned that a lot of times the healing that we need in our hearts, in our emotions, in our soul, for things that have happened in our life, things that we've been through, things that other people have done to us, things that we've done to ourselves. In order to receive that healing, a lot of times we have to forgive and repent ourselves because when we don't forgive and when we don't repent of, of holding things against people, of holding things against God, of, of trying to, to do things our own way and trying to make things happen on our own schedule, when we're doing that, we're holding on to that pain and that hurt. And as long as we're holding on to it, it's, it's our choice to not be healed. And Isaiah 30, 15 says, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. And to me, that verse is highlighting it. In repentance and rest, in letting go, in repenting, that's when we're saved. That's when we're when our soul is saved from that pain that we carry. And that was one of the first thing, the first thing I think that God had to do, do in order to take me through this rite of passage. <laughs> um, maybe that was the, the crux and the, the high, most difficult part of, of that rite of passage was coming to that point when I realized what I needed to surrender to him in order for him to heal all that stuff that he was allowing to come up that had been buried inside of me. <clears throat> so, so that was an amazing day that day. And it somewhere in that in that time period, I also discovered, um, I also realized that God had been calling me to fast the news and social media. Um, he was very gracious to me in that through the whole way through March and April, I just felt a growing conviction that I needed to get off of Facebook and get off of the news, quit following the news because every I recognized that every time I did I would get angry inside and I finally started realizing it's not good for me to be angry and if something is constantly making me angry all the time that's not doing me any good and it's not doing anybody else any good because then I'm tempted to post things that are not the love of God <laughs> that aren't doing anybody else any good and um I started to to feel that um, our drive to know what's going on to sometimes in our culture right now we almost talk as if it's a virtue to know what's going on everywhere and I couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible that it says that <laughs> we are called to know the heart of God and to know what he wants us to do in our life um, we don't have to necessarily know everything that's going on. Now, there might be some people who, based on God's calling for their life, he does want them and need them to be aware of what's going on in this area or that area. So it's not a blanket statement that nobody should ever follow the news or whatever. I just started to realize that my drive to know what's going on was misplaced. And, um... Eventually, I did decide, all right, I'm done with it. I'm done with, uh, I, for I don't know how long, I am staying off of Facebook, except for our church's group where we shared prayer requests, which I bookmarked that so I could go to just that page and see who needed prayer without following the whole Facebook feed and all the stuff that came through there. Um, and... I also said, I'm done watching and following news. God, if if you want me to look at something, you, I'll, I'm sure I'll hear it and I'll check with you. But I did that. And um, 
God was very gracious to me because I thought this was my idea. Um, after God healed me and after I started learning things, <coughs> I realized, excuse me, <coughs> I realized that he had actually been calling and telling me to do that. And I wasn't recognizing his voice, what he was asking me to do. I thought it was my idea, but I did it. And eventually as I moved into April and May, as I had been doing this, I started realizing through the things that I, I heard other people say, things that I recognize in myself, that perhaps the biggest reason that I felt like I couldn't hear God speak was because I had was allowing too much other too many other voices in my mind and in my life. Um, someone I can't remember who um, said that in order to hear God, if we're having trouble hearing God, God's not going to become louder. We must become quieter. And that was, that's how it is. Um, all of our Facebook feeds, our Instagram or TikTok or whatever social media you happen to follow are all people's voices that are coming into our lives. And it's difficult to read those and block the voices when they're not good voices. Um, and even good people, even people we love can say things into our lives that aren't good. Um, and the news media, any news out there, those are voices coming into our lives. And when we have all these voices coming in constantly, that fills our minds so much that it's nearly impossible to hear the gentle, quiet whisper of God speaking to us. And this is what I started to realize and that this is why God was asking me to fast social media and the news because all of those voices were getting in the way of what he was trying to speak to me. And, um, and that was an important lesson for me that um, I probably fasted social media and the news for, I don't remember how many months before I started to very carefully wade back in and try and find a good balance for me and try to find from God how often for me was okay for me to look and follow and how much for me was too much. Um, and I, I noticed as time went by that when I went into the too much, I stopped hearing God showing me things. Um, so this was an important thing that I realized. So, um, the next part of my story is in May of 2020. Um, by that time I was feeling healed and I was really enjoying going out for walks that dead end road became my prayer closet. And I would get up in the morning and I would go out for a walk first thing and I would just talk to God out there. And it became my, my prayer closet as Christians like to call it because out there nobody could get to me. Um, I bring my phone so that I could write down things that um, like an online journal because I moved my journal to an online document so I could write on it anywhere. So I bring my phone so I could write stuff down but I wouldn't. I wouldn't take calls. I wouldn't go on Facebook or, or do anything on my phone other than just writing down what I was talking to God, journaling while I was out there walking and talking to God. And for me, it was like closing the door is in a traditional prayer closet. It was shutting out everything. It was getting away from the to-do lists at home and everything that was before me that I needed to do. So I'd go out there and walk and I treasured that by that point. I felt like I'm walking with God. Um, <clears throat> I was still, you know, he, he gr would gradually show me things, you know, like I would be out there and just think of a scripture verse. So I would look it up on my phone and talk to him about that scripture verse. And I just felt like I was spending time with him. And because of it, the whole world was shut down still, um, I still didn't have much work to do, so it was easier to do that in the mornings, and I loved it. And one morning um, in May, I did it most mornings, but I, not every morning. One morning in May, I woke up, and I was debating whether or not to go on a walk that morning. I don't I don't remember why, but 
I really felt like God was saying, no, come out and walk with me. It was just sort of an impression and a tug that I felt. And so I was like, okay. So, you know, I got up and put on my shoes and got dressed and started out on the walk. And um, as I walked past my mailbox, I noticed two pieces of trash in the ditch that I had noticed many times before and had just been ignoring. You know, I would think, I wish people wouldn't throw stuff in the ditch is about as far as my thoughts ever went. But that time when I noticed them, the thought went through my head, pick them up. And it went through my, I kept walking and it was like, pick them up. And I was like, God, is that you telling me to pick that up? And then I said, well, Lord, if it is you, then remind me when I get back. And I kept walking. But then the thought went through my head, go back and do it now. And I stopped and I was like, God, is that you talking to me? I wasn't sure. And I was finally like, well, <clears throat> it doesn't do any harm to pick up trash along the side of the road. After all, I suppose there's no one else to do it. <clears throat> um, you know, my neighbors are elderly. I live in a country road. There is literally no one who's ever going to come along and pick up this trash. So I guess I might as well do it just in case this is God. So I went back. I got a bag. I went back out. And when I reached down and picked up those two pieces of trash that I had been ignoring for weeks, every time I mentioned them, noticed them, the thought went through my head or these words went through my mind that went, I will clean up the things which have been ignored. And I was like, God, is that you talking, telling me this? <clears throat> As I walked, I saw some more things. I saw a cigarette case. I picked it up. I saw fast food cups. I picked them up. I saw beer cans. I picked them up. And I already noticed that these things that I was picking up could represent various sin in people's lives. That cigarettes could represent addiction. That fast food could represent gluttony. Not that you're always gluttonous if you eat fast food, but it could represent it, that beer cans represented alcoholism. Um, <clears throat> and I thought maybe God was saying he was going to clean up these sins too in people's lives, but I wasn't sure. And I came upon a water bottle and when I picked it up, it was filled with something really nasty inside. Um, I don't know what it was. It was nasty, but I picked it up. And the words went through my mind, I will clean up that which is supposed to be pure, but isn't. And these thoughts were so clear that I started crying. I was like, God, I think you're talking to me and I'm hearing you like I have begged to hear you for 19 years. <clears throat> I bent down to pick up something that looked small, but when I went to pull it up, it turned out to be buried half under the grass and the dirt, and it was something much larger. And God said, I will pull out things that are deep and larger than they look. And then I started picking up everything I could find because God was talking to me. I picked up teeny tiny little bits left of cigarette butts and tiny pieces of straw that the mowers had broken up into a million pieces and as I picked up the little small things he said I will clean up the insignificant things as well <clears throat> I got a little ways down the road I looked at my bag that was full of more trash than I had known that that tiny little stretch of road had and he said there is more sin that needs cleaning out than is apparent just as you've been ignoring the two pieces you've seen for weeks. So you, and this second you I knew was a plural you for the whole church. He said, so you, the church, have been ignoring what you see. But when you are finally willing to address it, I will clean up far more than you ever knew was there. And I pulled out my phone and wrote down word for word what God was speaking to me. <clears throat> That was a huge shift that day, a breakthrough in my life because of what God had spoke to me and because 
when I thought about it, just in awe for days, I was in awe that I had heard God like that. And when I thought about it, I realized what if I had not obeyed and gone back into the house and got a bag to start picking up the trash. If I hadn't obeyed, I would have missed the very thing that I had prayed for for 19 years, hearing God speak to me like that. I learned that obedience is the starting point for many of the things that we want to receive from God. And a lot of times that obedience is just simply, it's going to feel like just doing what our conscience is tapping us on the shoulder about. That's all it's going to feel like. It's not going to be a, a booming, this is definitely God voice. It's just going to be a little tap on the shoulder from what feels like your conscience. But obeying that, but God speaking through that and obeying that can be the start of everything. I started for days and <coughs> I started just walking around and every time my conscience tugged at me for anything, I would jump to do it just in case God was about to speak to me. And sometimes he did. And a lot of times it was stupid little stuff that I had just gotten used to ignoring in my life picking up stuff around the house or or doing some little task that I just would constantly put off to later and and sometimes he did speak after I followed that little nudge that little conscience tap on the shoulder to do that <clears throat> so through the middle of 2020 um that's kind of where I was at I felt like I didn't very often hear God speak like that at all. And I still struggled not to get frustrated about that <laughs> because I wanted to hear him like that all the time. I mean, he spoke once to me that way. I heard him once that, that day. I heard him uh, one or two other times. But what about all the other days when, you know, I was like, God, so are you not speaking to me every day? Am I, you know, what am I doing wrong that that I can't always hear you like that, or are you not speaking, but your word says your sheep hear your voice, but, and I, I still had a lot of questions despite that experience. <clears throat> so that's how I was going through, through more of 2020. Um, but another thing that I was also learning was to take the word of God more literally than I had before. I started realizing different verses in the Bible where I would kind of dismiss them for what I thought they meant or make excuses or um, I would, I don't know, interpret them in whatever way. Um, and the example that I want to share um, is when in August I had to go to a wedding and um, through this time, I'd still been gaining weight. So, and I didn't think about what I was going to wear to the wedding until like the week before the wedding. And all of a sudden it hit me. Oh my gosh, you have nothing to wear because all the things I'd worn to previous, not, previous weddings, everything in my closet that was at all wedding worthy didn't fit anymore because I gained too much weight. And, um, through most of my life, I'm, I'm very short waisted. So through most of my life, anytime I needed a dress for something, most of the time I would wind up having to sew it myself. I did my learn to sew from my mom and my grandmother. Um, and so it's not something I do a lot. And it's, it's especially nowadays, I don't do it very much. And, but like I said, it was a week before the wedding. I was like, there's no time for me to, to, go through everything that it takes to make a dress and alter the pattern so it's going to fit me and whatever. I have no choice but to go to the stores and find something that's going to fit because, or at least somehow fit, because I can't go to a wedding in leggings and big sweatshirts and sweaters, which was, or big t-shirts, which was what I was wearing most of the time because that's about all I had left that fit me. Um, so when that hit me that I had to go shopping, not I, I cannot, uh, plenty of you will probably relate the defeated feeling that I immediately felt. Um, a lot of women like to shop. I do not like to shop at all. I've never really liked shopping. 
Um, maybe it's because it's even clothes shopping. Maybe it's because so little out there fits me because I'm so short waisted. Um, maybe it's just me. I don't know, but I've never liked to shop at all. Um, but shopping for things that are supposed to fit well <laughs> is by far the worst of all of it. So I literally sobbed because the feeling of defeat, oh my gosh, I have to go shopping. This is going to be so horrible. I don't, I've only got a week. How in the heck am I going to find anything that's going to fit me in a week? It's probably going to cost a lot. I'll never wear this dress again, but I have no choice. It was just it was a bad moment for me personally um and i'm sure plenty of people can relate but there might be people that aren't so if you can't relate just you know figuratively pat me on the shoulder say it's okay honey anyway that's how i felt <laughs> um and uh but after some tears and everything and i went out on a walk to talk to god about it again and he reminded me of the verses in Matthew. Jesus said, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So I was like, God, I always thought that verse was for people who were worried about having any clothes to wear. And I've never been in that position in my life. Very few of us in the United States ever have been. Um, but it doesn't specifically say that. He said, why are you anxious about clothing? So I took a deep breath, said, okay, Lord, your word says not to be anxious about clothing. Your word says that you'll provide the clothing that we need. So I'm going to trust you. Show me where to go. Show me what store to go to. Whatever. So <clears throat> that's what I prayed. And my daughter said she would go with me because she needed something to wear too. And she likes shopping, but she was very sympathetic for how her mother felt. <laughs> and um, she said, I'll go with you. So we went together and I was like, Lord, so what store do I go to? I do not want to spend days. I don't want to spend hours. You show me. What store do I go to? And I felt like he was saying, well, I didn't I didn't hear any clear voice again. I just kind of felt like I should start at Macy's. Um, I needed some, I knew I would need some undergarments to go with whatever dress I wound up wearing. And I knew Macy's had that. So I was like, okay, let's start there. And my daughter was like, are you sure? You never shop there. And I was like, yeah, I just feel like that's where I should start. So I'm going to go there and start there. So we went to Macy's and I went to, to find the undergarments that I needed. And I went back in the fitting room, just trusting that God was going to lead me. Went back in the fitting room and there on the hook was the dress. It was perfect. It fit me perfectly. It was in the right size. It was a style that I that I liked. I put a, on the undergarments. I tried the dress on. I looked at the tag. It was clearance to like $17 or something like that. And I stood there in the fitting room having spent only about 10 minutes shopping. <laughs> and I started crying. I realized, oh my gosh, Lord. You went shopping for a dress for me. I didn't even have to flip through the racks. You somehow had somebody hand deliver this dress in my size to the fitting room that you led me to walk into. And I was just overwhelmed at his care for me and his faithfulness to 
his word that he had led me to bring before him, to trust him over. And I don't think we can just grab verses and willy-nilly say, oh, okay, here's a verse. I want this in my life. Here's a verse. I'm going to try to make a match up. I don't think we can do that. But I have brought my problem before God, and he had led me to that verse. And he had put the faith, which is a gift, in my heart that that verse matched my situation that I had brought before him. And then he was faithful to it. And I was overwhelmed and amazed. <coughs> so as the months continued, and I continued slowly gaining more weight, um, you know, every time I thought about it, I was just like, Lord, that verse also says, do not be anxious about what shall we eat or what shall we drink. You know, in my life, I've never gained weight easily. Um, the slow weight gain that I'd been having over a couple years was, uh, maybe, I don't know if I can say it was different for me, but I've never been a person who put on, packed on weight easily or lost weight easily. The only times in my life where I had ever lost weight, it took a, like a whole life, serious, intense exercise and eating program where where that pretty much became the focus of every day is making sure that I exercised and that I did all this meal prep for eating extremely strict and extremely healthy. And, you know, it was just like take over your life kind of a thing. And, um, and the last time I'd even tried that, I had like lost one pound in three or four weeks or something ridiculous like that. It, it just, you know, even my husband said, why well, don't you don't even really eat bad. And I don't know why you're, you actually are, you're still slowly gaining weight and why you don't lose weight easily when you're not already not eating bad. And, and it, it was true when I eat super strict, even extremely super strict to start exercising, I don't usually lose weight. So I was like, Lord, that, that verse also is about what shall we eat or what shall we drink? So I don't want to take my focus off of you where you're taking me because, you know, with these walks with you in the morning and this time that I spend with you, Lord, I feel like to do any exercise regime like that is going to take my focus off of you. And this verse says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. And it doesn't say some things will be added, but knowing how learning how to eat and live healthy isn't part of it no it said all these things so I just kept saying every time my weight gain bothered me <clears throat> every time I thought about how I knew I needed to um somehow figure out why I was gaining weight and um and it wasn't a fast gaining weight. I'd like to gain a pound every three or four months or something like that. But it had been consistent for quite a few years. So I was, by that point, you know, <coughs> I knew it wasn't good. I needed to stop somehow, sometime. But I just kept saying, Lord, I know I need to do this, but I'm not willing to take my focus off of you. And this verse that you brought to me says, if I keep my focus and seek you first, that everything else will be added. So this is in your hands and in your timing. And I want whatever it is that I need to do in changing my eating or exercising or whatever, whatever that is, I want it to be a reflection of my relationship with you. I'm not willing to change my focus. <clears throat> Another thing, as we moved into 2020, or I guess I should stop and say by the end of 2020 in December, um, another pivotal moment is when God started showing me ways that I was leaning on my own understanding instead of trusting him. Um, Proverbs 3, 5 is a very well-known verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And we all know that. And most of us, maybe a lot of us think that we are. I thought I was doing pretty good at it. But God started showing me more and more instances and times when, um, when I was not 
um, I was leaning on my own understanding. And this whole thing of the back and forth of hearing his voice was one of them. I realized that, um, just a second. Um, just a second here. I want to make sure this is actually streaming. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, I realized that I was leaning on my own understanding in this whole question of seeking him, um, of hearing his voice that I had in my head, what hearing him was supposed to be like, you know, it was supposed to be like that, that day when I picked up trash back in May, it was supposed to be like that all the time. And I still struggled with frustration that that was still so rare. I mean, it happened once. So if it happened once, why wasn't it happening all the time? And what was I doing wrong? And, you know, all these questions. And suddenly I realized in December, there was just a day as I was praying, but I was like, I think God led me to the point where I prayed this. It was like he prompted me to do it. Um, when I was like, Lord, your word says, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice. So I'm tired of all this back and forth of this by the sometimes whatever. And I just told him, I said, I'm done saying that I don't hear your voice because I realize now that I am allowing my words to contradict the words of Jesus. And do I really think Jesus was lying? He said, my sheep hear my voice. I'm saying, I don't hear your voice. I've been saying that, but I'm done. I just realized that contradiction. I realized I was leaning on my own understanding and I was contradicting Jesus. <laughs> and so I just made the commitment. I'm done saying that. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to say instead. I'm just giving it to you, but I'm done saying that. And it wasn't too long after that. I don't remember if it was the same day or it might've been a couple days later when I was talking to him and I realized <clears throat> he reminded me how people learn to communicate in their language. For me, it's English. Uh, and he pointed out to me how I have essentially taught my children everything they know about communicating in English over the last 25 years. I, um, I was a stay at home mom. So yeah, they learned some things about speaking words from dad and other people, but predominantly I was the one with them every day. I was the one teaching them how to say their first words when they would say things wrong or not know what something was. I would teach them what the word was. I would teach them how to do sentences. And then I homeschooled them for many years, which I know most people don't, but I did. So I taught them how to read and write in English. I taught them how to communicate, how to write essays, how to write research papers. Um, and then as we got older and, you know, as they would get into arguments, I would teach them how to resolve arguments with each other and the proper way of communicating with each other. And I realized that even though now all three are in their twenties, I still sometimes have the opportunity to teach them something more about communication in English with people, um, depending on what the situation was. And I realized, you know, 20 years, 25 years, <coughs> that was a process, a very long process of lessons, many, many, many lessons day in and day out. And most of those lessons were just part of everyday life. They weren't like, I mean, the schooling lessons were sit down lessons, but a lot of those lessons were just everyday life as things came up. And God showed me that his Holy Spirit was my teacher and that teaching me communication with God was like that. It wasn't a, do I hear God's voice or do I not hear God's voice? Yes or no question. It's a learning process. And when I realized that, that he was my teacher, it totally shifted in my mind and in my life. 
it was like oh okay <laughs> so I determined from that point forward that every time I thought about wanting to hear God's voice more rather than the whole do I hear don't I hear whose fault is it that I'm not question like I had been going through for 19 and a half years by this point instead I was going to look for and eagerly watch and wait for the next lesson and that was a huge another huge shift in my life in in December of 2020 that was a huge shift to realize that but I also realized and saw that God did not show me that until I made the choice to lean on his word rather than my own understanding until I realized which I believe it was his grace that showed me that I was contradicting Jesus and I made the choice to no longer do that and to take him at his word and just leave it up to him that it was okay if I didn't understand I would just leave it up to him I had to make that choice first to trust in him and his word and then he opened my eyes to understand how my thinking had been wrong for 19 and a half years <coughs> that was so that was like a double lesson it was a lesson on how learning to hear his voice works but it was also a lesson that he started showing me more and more places to apply it to places where you know just tons of little things the 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 list if i tried to make a list it would be huge of little places in my life where he started showing me i was leaning on my own understanding instead of leaning instead of truly trusting that his word meant what it was and as I, he showed me those and i made the choice to change my thinking and trust him he would open my mind to see more that i needed in that area of my life and it was just that's what made that that small little moment so pivotal because it started having a ripple effect over so many other areas of my life and <clears throat> i know this is getting really long but i only have really one uh a, a little bit more to share um in april i did finally get the new job so by this time i had gone back to work uh work had picked back up again and i was back in the 24 7 job and i had to trust god to walk me through many months of that and i just kept getting up and going for walks in the morning before i went to work most days um sometimes it was raining and i would spend time with god in the living room <coughs> um but i started realizing that on days when it was nice and he was sometimes he would call me out to go for a walk and if I decided I don't feel like walking I'm just gonna stay in the living room I would miss out but on days when it was raining and he wasn't calling me out to walk he would meet me in the living room and so it wasn't like a rule I had to follow it was follow call, following his calling what he was calling me for, for each day and um, and in April after all those months and uh, years at that point of job searches um he he led me to start my own business um which up and i used to have my own business years ago and up until that moment i hadn't wanted my own business again even when people brought it up i was like no i don't think so even though i didn't know why i didn't think so i didn't mind having my own business i'm all for entrepreneurship in a lot of ways um but i didn't think that's what i wanted until suddenly in april um i was having a, a conversation with my brother about it and he again brought up have you ever considered just freelancing being a consultant um and even though he'd mentioned it before and i thought about it before for some reason when he said at that time there was a shift inside of me and i heard it echoing and i started saying lord is this you and over the course of like two days suddenly i went from just wanting a new job and not wanting my own business or to be anything having to do with that to suddenly totally wanting it by that point you know we've been in the pandemic for over a year and companies closed companies were selling companies shifted all kinds of things and i i real i got to the point where i realized 
God is the one who provides for me, regardless of whether I'm self-employed or whether I'm employed through a company. If I'm employed through a company, then God has to keep the whole company afloat in order to provide for me through that job, or has to keep it at least afloat enough that I have that job. But if I'm my own boss, if I'm running my own business, then how much easier is, is it for God? <laughs> not that anything's difficult for God. So that's kind of funny, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily make sense that I was thinking this way. It's just sort of thoughts that occurred to me. And I was like, you know what? It really doesn't matter whether I'm self-employed or employed for a company. God's the one who provides for me anyway. And now if I have my own job, if I'm my own boss, then no one can tell me where to work or when to work. No one can tell me I have to work at seven o'clock in the morning. If I'm going to go for a walk every morning because God calls me out to go for a walk. If I'm my own boss, I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm going against my boss's wishes to take off that morning until 10 o'clock so that I could spend three hours walking with God. Um, this actually sounds great all of a sudden. And you know, the Bible says that God gives us the desires of our heart. Um, but a lot of times I think people think that that means that, oh, God's going to give me these things that I want. And that's not what it means. It means that he puts desires in our hearts. That's what that means. And then he fulfills them, which is actually fantastic because who wouldn't want to actually want to do the things that God, I mean, if, if there are things that God's called you to do in your life, wouldn't you rather want to do them than be like, Oh God wants me to do this. And I don't really want to do it. No, he doesn't. I mean, sometimes he asks us to sacrifice things to, to give things up. There's definitely that sacrifice against our flesh. But when it comes to the call of God on our life, the things that he is calling us to make a difference in our world. He puts the desires inside of us to do those things, because if we have a heart for him, if we want his will, then he says, okay, you want my will. I'm going to put the desire inside of you to do those things that are my will for you. And that's what I recognized happened to that, that weekend. I had a sudden shift from not wanting to be my own boss to very much wanting to be my own boss. And in the space of two days, I had a contact with the company. And in the space of a week, I had done interviews and I had my first big client for, for my own business. And I still work predominantly with that company. Um, but it was, a sudden shift, a sudden change. And it was what I had prayed for, for quite a few years. <laughs> but at the same time, by that point, it didn't seem like so much of a big deal because God had, where God had brought me in my walk with him was such that even the 24 seven nature of my past job was no longer weighing on me anymore. And I was so glad that he had brought me to that point. He had also given me a chance to train others to take my place so that um, the, the people that were, that were there <coughs> <coughs> wouldn't be negatively affected by, by me leaving. Because sometimes, you know, when you're in a senior position, it does affect everybody under you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'm not really going to share any more about that, but yes, he did. He did in April of 2021, finally, um, move me on to, um, the new income. And, um, so I think that's all I'm going to share about that right now. Um, so the only story I have left to share is, um, going through 2021 and last year, there's, there's many things that God did in me and showed me, but, um, by the time I got to September, um, it was still just a series of lots of opportunities and times of walking with God and God showing me tons, so many little things in my life that he was fine tuning and, and changing in my life and walking with him was just kept getting, you know, better and better and deeper and deeper 
mostly except for the times when I allowed my focus to shift and I get caught up in, in other things too much and then I'd realize oh no my focus is shifting and I can feel God I feel like I'm not as close walking as closely to you as I as I was and I would drop everything that was taking my focus and put my focus back on him and and be right there next to him again um so when we come to September um September 16th was actually the day I wrote it down that morning I woke up really 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 early um like four or something in the morning and I tried to go back to sleep I was having trouble going back to sleep and I started feeling the urge to go out to the living room to pray and talk to God and finally the urge got strong enough I was like okay God I think this is you calling me so I'm gonna go out and I felt like he said bring bring paper and pen and bring my journal so my journal is like I mentioned I put it online so usually I'm using my tablet to write um, so I picked up my tablet to go out to write down whatever he wanted to to journal or write down whatever he wanted to say to me and I got out there in the living room and he very clearly said corrected me and said no I said pen and paper and I was like wow okay so I went and I got a paper journal and <clears throat> I'm not going to share everything that, that he spoke to me that morning. Um, some of it was very precious. Um, but towards the end of that time that I spent just worshiping him and talking to him and listening to the things that he was sharing with me, um, towards the end, my stomach growled. <laughs> and as my stomach growled, I thought, wow, I'm hungry. And God said, I want you to fast. And I said, okay, Lord, fast how? Um, I have never in my life been able to do a total food fast. The few times that I have tried for whatever reason, um, after about 24 hours, my, I would start to have physical signs and symptoms that would scare my husband and I, and, um, my husband would say, go eat something. I'm not taking you to the ER. Um, I don't want to take you to the ER, but I will have to if you don't go eat something and your body doesn't go, go to normal, you know, just not just signs that, you know, maybe it's normal. I don't know. And I've always wondered if I just pushed through that, would I have been fine and been able to fast, but we never pushed through, you know, every time I had tried, when I reached that point, my husband would say, go eat something and I would go eat something. Um, so most of the fasts I've done over the years were ones like the social media one or, you know, laying something down for a while to give God that attention and time instead. Um, but this time he had said, I want you to fast right when my stomach rumbled and I was hungry. So I was like, God, do you want me to act to fast food? If you tell me to, I will do it. And I will trust that you will carry me through whatever, you know, what happened has happened in the past <clears throat> when I've tried, but I'll trust you for that. If, if you're telling me to fast food and he said, no, you can eat plants. I said, okay, that sounds, I'll do it. And <clears throat> so I let my husband know and I didn't, and my daughter that lived at home knew no one else knew. Um, but I, I started doing that and I, um, it was surprisingly easy when I compared it to times when I had tried to go on strict diets because this time I wasn't following a strict diet. I was simply obeying God. And when God tells you to do something and you choose to obey his grace and his strength will be there for you. And it was for me. So it was surprisingly easy easy. I just, I ate a lot of fruits. I ate a lot of vegetables. I ate a ton of berries because there was so many berries available where I live that tasted so good in, um, in September and October. Um, I ate nuts because that was basically if the food came, if I was eating essentially what came directly off of a plant, I would eat it. I didn't count calories. I didn't worry about how much I ate. Uh, it's just what I ate. And if it hadn't come directly off a plant, then I didn't eat it because God said I could eat plants and I was to fast everything else. So that's what I did. And it was even easy when a few times when I'd be out to eat and look at the menu. And I remember once at one place, I realized the only thing on the entire menu that was just plants was lettuce and tomatoes. 
There was nothing else. <clears throat> Every other vegetable that they sold was boxed and came with preservatives or came with <clears throat> oils and so forth. And I let myself, I ate olive oil because that's pressed, you know, like cold pressed olive oil. That's directly from a plant. But I didn't eat things that were with processed oils or made with processed oil. If it was made with a processed oil or had any oil or preservative or anything added to it, then I didn't eat it. So it was just if it came right off a plant, then that's what I did. <clears throat> and um, and I asked God when he told me to do this fast, I said, God, what is this fast for? Um, because a lot of people believe that when you fast, it's usually for something specific. There's a verse in the Bible about breaking bondage. Um, breaking chains and things in your life and so I was like God is, is this for something you know what is this for and I didn't get an answer but by this time I was at peace with not getting answers when I asked God questions rather than getting frustrated that he was talking and I wasn't hearing it so I said okay Lord that's okay you don't have to tell me I'll obey even if I don't know why um, so I was doing that through the rest of September and um, after two weeks or so, my husband and my daughter, my daughter, you know, said to me, how much do you weigh? You look like you're losing weight. And I said, I, I don't know, because the thought had crossed my mind. I wonder if I'm going to lose weight doing this. But I was like, no, I'm not even going to get on the scale because this is obedience to God. This is not a weight loss plan. I'm not going to change the focus. I've been saying that for a year and a half now that whenever I lose weight, I want it to be a ref reflection of my relationship with God. I don't want it to be a regime and I don't know what this fast is for. God didn't tell me it was about losing weight or whatever. God didn't answer me. I'm just obeying. So I told him, I said, I don't know. I'm not getting on the scale. My husband was like, really? And I was like, nope, not even getting on the scale. <laughs> God told me to fast. I'm doing it. I don't know why, but I'm just obeying. He said, okay. And my daughter said, okay. And I continued into October and I continued my walks with God and I just, I ate a lot of berries, I ate a lot of fruits and vegetables, <laughs> I ate a lot of nuts, I ate a lot of popcorn, just the whole organic kernels popped in a bit of olive oil because any other popcorn had preservatives. <laughs> That's what I snacked on. Um, <clears throat> and by the middle of September, I could feel that I'd lost quite a bit of weight, but every time through those months, those weeks that I had asked him, why am I doing this fast? I said, God, are you going to tell me now why I'm doing this fast? And there's no answer. I said, okay. I'd ask him, God, how long am I doing this? There's no answer. I said, okay, I'll just keep going. <laughs> and um, in the middle of October, one of the times that I was talking and I again asked him those questions, he said, um, he said I could add meat back in, but... I knew it was clean meat, you know, it wasn't like deep fried or whatever big, you know, just plain beef or chicken or fish or whatever. So I was like, oh, okay, Lord, I'll start adding a little bit of that in, but I'd been pretty happy and healthy. It felt pretty good eating the plant. So I didn't add a lot back in, but I was like, okay. And, and in the middle of September, you know, I, I don't remember if this was the same day or a couple days later, but again, I asked him. I said, God, now that I'm adding meat back in, are you going to tell me what this fast was about yet? <clears throat> oh, wait, that was another morning. He had me wake up. At, I woke up at like four something in the morning and he called me out to pray. So again, I went out and I spent time with him just worshiping and praying for the people that he laid on my heart. And <clears throat> towards the end of that time, I again asked him and said, <clears throat> God, are you going to tell me what this fast was about now? And that time he answered me. He said, it's my gift to you. And the moment he said that, I knew what he meant. He was, because all of the times over the last 18 plus months, when I had stubbornly said, no, whatever I, whatever, whenever I lose weight or whatever, I want it to be a reflection of my relationship with God. I don't want to change my focus. All of those times when I have said that flooded back to me. And when he said, it's my, was my gift, this fast was my gift to you. I knew that's what he was referring to. And I just, again, broke down in tears. You guys are going to think I cry all the time, but <laughs> 
I'm a woman, so maybe I, I can get away with it. Anyway, <clears throat> I broke down into tears because I felt his love flow over me. That he said, you honored me. You know, he, he was saying, you honored me. You desired to keep me first in my life. And you waited and waited and waited and just trusted me. And this was my gift to you. And <clears throat> so then I was like, okay, then. I'm going to get on the scale. <laughs> if this was the whole point of this fast was a gift for me, for my health and, and my weight and my body and all that, then I'm going to get on the scale. <laughs> so I went and got on the scale and I had lost 12 pounds in four weeks, which remember I said every other time in my life, I had gone extreme stuff and would only lose a couple pounds a month if that. So when I saw how much weight I had lost in those four weeks and I heard those words of God echoing in my mind, this is my gift to you. It was just an amazing moment of how much God cares for me and what walking with him, how it's supposed to be a part of every part of our life. And he is faithful when we trust him in the ways that he asks us to trust him for the things that he asks us to trust him. He's faithful to his word when he gives us verses in the Bible to apply to the things that we bring before him. And um, <clears throat> since then, I've, I've, I'm no longer eating only plants, but I, it's, I was kind of tempted sometimes to go back and I felt like God was just saying, no, just keep asking me. Just keep seeking me and keep trusting me and involve me in your decisions every day about what you eat that day and when you go out to dinner. So, you know, when I go out to dinner, usually I'll pick healthier things on the menu, but I don't trouble myself about um, trying to eat super strict. But then sometimes we go out to dinner a lot and I'm like, you start feeling, you know, we need to stop going out to dinner as much. And sometimes I'll take a couple of days and just eat more plants. And other times <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm overall just asking him to show me and I'm, I'm learning even more than I already had known before about how so many of the foods in the United States have very little real food left in them. Everything's synthesized. So many things are synthesized and, stripped down and refined and then they try to enrich them with chemical versions of vitamins and they're so far from the original plants which i already knew a lot of this but i'm learning even more about that um and that's not what this video is about this video this this testimony is about how god wants to lead us in every area of our life and for most of all of these stories um i didn't I didn't share hardly any of this with very many people and there's still so much that I haven't shared because I worried, you know, God, what if I don't want to, to share these stories and have somebody want to think that they have to do what you told me to do, that they have to pick up trash on the side of the road in order to hear your voice, that they have to go for a walk on a dead end road in order to, to, to find you. Um, that they have to eat plants, that, that they have to go to Macy's when they need a dress. <laughs> I don't want people to do that. Um, I forgot one other short story. This was in July of 2021, and I'm going to add this real quick, this short story, um, because this has to, again, do with my worry about if I didn't hear God's voice and somebody needed me. Um, so this was a day when my my I was headed down to a town about 20 minutes south of us and the song that I woke up with that morning was called when I'm with you and um it's a, a praise song from Christian radio and um so I woke up that morning with the song just running through me and when I asked God why that song was running through me I didn't hear an answer but it was just a song that that I hadn't listened to in a while and I loved it. So I was, I had it like on replay on my phone that morning and I was headed down to my daughter's house about 20 minutes south of us. And, um, so I was listening to the song and kind of talking to God while I sang along and on the way down, 
and I passed a man walking on the side of the road. And when I passed him, or as I was coming up on him, I heard myself ask him if he wanted a ride down to to that town. And, you know, uh, I was, you know, driving along at 50 miles an hour or whatever it is on that road there. And um, I was like, Lord, was that you? Normally, women don't stop and ask strange men or offer men, strange men walking along the side of the road a ride. Um, and I was like, but I will, if you're telling me to, because I want to be obedient. And, um, I thought, and I started to get kind of that, you know, do you remember when you were a kid, if you were disobeying, doing something you weren't supposed to, you'd kind of get that, oh, I'm going to get in trouble if I get caught kind of feeling. That's kind of the feeling I was getting. And, um, which I'd come to realize that sometimes when I was asking God, is that you? And he'd give me that feeling as a way of saying, yes, it's me, go away. Um, <clears throat> so I started getting that feeling and I was like, okay, God, but my husband would not, can, and, and many people don't consider it a safe thing to do. And as I said those words, as I thought those words to God, I was singing the song at the same time. And the words of the song came out of my mouth where it says, um, um, it said, I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed. I'm safe when you are with me. And the moment those words that I sang those words out of my mouth, I knew it was God telling me to offer that man a ride. So I said, okay, God, I turned around. I went back. I offered, I said to him the words I heard myself say, he was like, you do not know how rare this is for a woman to offer a ride. And I told him, I said, well, God told me to. And I said, what if it's not safe? And God said that he was with me. And so I was perfectly safe. And, and he laughed and he talked about just while I, I gave him the ride, he just talked about how he trained himself to walk 50 miles a day and so forth. Um, but it was the easiest thing in the world. I was not scared to do it. I was not worried. There was no trepidation. It just was the most natural thing as if I'd done it a million times, even though it was something really far out there. And when I thought back about it later that day, I was overwhelmed with amazement at how much trouble God had gone to, to give me a song that morning that had the words and time it right. So that as at that exact moment, when I was double checking with him because it wasn't normally considered safe for a woman to do that, that the exact words of the song would come out that I would be singing those exact words at the exact moment and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was him. And then how he made it so easy that it wasn't, it wasn't a nerve nerve wracking thing. It wasn't, you know, all those times when I was like, when I would pray, God, what if somebody needs me to do something far out and I don't know if it's you, I'd imagine myself being full of nervousness and trepidation and stumbling over my words and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't, it was as natural and easy as if I had done it a million times before, even though I'd never done it before. And I have no idea if that meant anything to that guy that I picked him up and gave him a ride for 20 minutes that day. Um, I have no idea. Maybe it meant nothing to him. Maybe he was, a, I, I don't know. But for me, it was God demonstrating that I didn't need to worry <laughs> that he was able. And if he needed me to do something way far out, he was very able and capable of doing whatever I needed so that I would know. And so that it would be natural and that it wouldn't be weird and, and that he, he was just, all I had to do was trust him. All I had to do was rely on him and just obey when he said to do something and everything else would fall into place. Um, <clears throat> so that, that was, that was my other little story that, um, got my stories a little mixed up, but anyway, so, you know, I didn't share this with hardly, hardly any people because I was like, what if, what if women everywhere think that they have to offer guys along the side of the road? You know, God, I don't want 
the people that I share these stories with to think that you're telling them to do all the same things you telling me to do because, because they were just, it's all part of my relationship with you. And God just told me, he said, just trust me. He said, I'll take care of that. He told me the things to share in this message. And then he said, he told me, he said, I have a unique and special place or way for each of my daughters and sons to meet with me. Just as the details of everyone's life are different, so the way for them to get alone with me is unique to each person. Tell them I will show them their way if they ask me. So that's what he told me to say, to share when I finished sharing this message. To tell you, whoever you are, whether you're watching this live right now or whether you're watching this recording months from now, that God has a unique and special way that he wants to meet with you and it's going to fit into your life. And it's not going to look like mine and my stories. It's going to be unique to you. But all you have to do is ask him to show you that way. Now, I don't know if he's going to show you that way immediately. I don't know whether it's going to take you a couple months to find it or a couple years to find it. I'm just saying ask him because he said, tell them I will show them their way if they ask me. He knows the timing. I don't know why I had to wait so long for him to do that shift in me from my job situation. I don't know why some of those lessons, why he picked December and May and August and July for each of those lessons. But he, the whole way through the Bible, there's so many things that he did. And it starts with at the appointed time. God has appointed times to do things in our life. And the more we seek him, the more prepared we will be. So we don't miss those times when they come. So just keep seeking him. And keep asking him. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to, to walk with you through your life. And walking with him is not supposed to be, you know, for many years I thought that in order to walk with God, you had to spend a certain amount of time every morning. And when you've got three little kids at home and they wake up earlier than you do and you're trying to, you know, Many people know that getting up to spend hours with God feels like a burden um, a lot of times. And a lot of times we think that's what we have to do. But God gave me um, a picture recently, a demonstration kind of. He told me when I was thinking about this, he told me to think about a dog that has, or two dogs, a dog that's learned to heal, to walk alongside its master, and a dog that hasn't. And he asked me, if you compare those two dogs, both on leashes, one walking right there beside its master every step of the way, and one, what's the other one normally doing? Normally, dogs that aren't doing that are pulling at their leash. They're running back and forth as far as the leash will let them go. And sometimes the master has to pull them up tight and close to keep them safe because the car's passing and they don't want to get hit. And other times they can let the leash out. And the dog's always at the end of the leash trying to get this, wherever they, it is they want to go. Uh, you know, for our dogs, it was usually as far ahead as they could get, you know. But God asked me, which dog is putting more effort into walking with their master? And immediately, I knew it was the one that wasn't walking right beside. The one that was at the end of the leash pulling and tugging. That was the one that was putting more effort into it. And which one was closest to God? The one that was right beside him. And how, what did that dog do to stay right beside its master? What had it learned to do? Was it a lot of work and effort to stay right beside the master? No, it's not. Dogs that are trained to heal, as they call it, walking right beside their master, they do it because of where their focus is. They've learned to always keep their primary focus on their master. So yeah, if a squirrel runs by or a car passes or another dog crosses their path, they notice it, but they don't allow it to pull their focus off of their master. And that's why they're able to walk right beside them. And they're expending less effort than the one that's 
gets distracted by the squirrel and gets distracted by the car and gets distracted by the other car and runs back and forth at the always at the end of the leash as far as the master will let them go or running and having to be called back if the master lets them off the leash the one that can stay closest to the master is expending less effort but it's all because their focus is on their master and that's what spending time with god that's what walking with god <clears throat> is like we don't have to spend tons and tons of effort to try to walk next to him we just put our focus on him and staying when our focus is on him then staying right next to him becomes a natural extension of that. And so for some people, when you are have your focus on God and you're walking next to him, then that master, because God is, is then your Lord and your master at that point. If he leads you and he sits down for three hours in a chair in the living room and you're right next to him, and so you're sitting down in a chair in the living room to spend time with God for three hours, well, that's what your walk with God is going to include. But if the walk that he's going on with you includes constant kids from <clears throat> five o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, then God's with you <laughs> every moment of that day, and you can keep your focus on him. You can learn. He can teach you to keep your focus on him through those crazy hours all day long and you're still walking with him through your life because your walk with him through your life is gonna look different than other people's. Mine includes walking on the dead end road a lot of times. Sometimes it includes getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go pray in the living room when he calls me. Sometimes it involves just sitting in the living room instead of going on a walk because it's raining or just because I don't feel like walking that day and I don't feel him calling me to go out that day. Sometimes it's going out to walk even though I don't feel like it because that's where he's calling me that morning. It's different and unique to all of us. And that's why God said, again, why he said, tell them that I will show them their way if they ask me. So that's how I'm closing. That's what I want to encourage everyone to do. I want these stories to make all of you hungry and eager to discover the things that God has for you in your relationship with him, in your future. In 2022, don't make it about a list of resolutions of what you think that you need and what your mind thinks that you need and that you should do and what you should be able to do, make it about just seeking him and a closer walk with him and everything else will follow that because that's what he wants. He desperately wants to spend that time with you. He wants that relationship with you. He wants to walk with you through your life. And if you seek him, he will do it. I don't can't make any promises about what that's gonna look like or how long it's gonna take or hope or, or what it's going to look like, but he will do it because he is faithful to his word. So I'm just going to go ahead and pray right now. Dear Father God, I thank you that you are faithful to your word, that faithfulness is part of your very nature, that your faithfulness is perfect and you don't go back on your word, Lord. Lord, I ask that for everyone hearing this message, if that, that if they choose to surrender their life to you. If they choose to say, Lord, whatever you want for me is what I want for me because I trust you. I trust you to know. Lord, I, I ask that every person that makes that choice, Lord, I thank you that you will show them the way that they can spend time with you, that you will teach them, Holy Spirit, how to focus on you, that you have paths for them, that you have a good path, a beautiful path in their life, and that you walk us through even the challenging moments, Lord, but they can become beautiful moments that we can go through difficult situations with rivers of peace running through our spirits despite the difficult situations, that you are the one that is our anchor, our rock, and our foundation, Lord, and I thank you that you are faithful to your word and that you are bringing so many people around the world to you in a wave, an unprecedented wave of people following you so that you 
Jesus are the head of the body and that you can orchestrate all of us in all of our lives to do and walk and be what you have called us to be so that we can reach a hurting world around us. And I thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness and your never-ending love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless everyone. I hope this encouraged you.